My name is Dr. Karen Stoltzner. I'm a linguist and uh, I, I do a number of things within the skeptical movement. I'm a research fellow for the, the James Randi Educational Foundation and uh, I write the bad language column for Skeptic Magazine. Uh, and I've just written a couple of books as well, so I do lots of different things. All right, so let's get into, uh, yesterday you did talk about exorcism. Yes, I um, did. If you want to go through that, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, well, I've just written a book which is actually going to the printers on uh, Monday and it's called God Bless America. Uh, and so one of the chapters is about demonic possession and exorcisms. And uh, so I thought that's a perfect topic to talk about at an event like this. And uh, I was looking at uh, forms of exorcism that are primarily practiced in the States today because uh, we still live in a demon haunted world, basically. Uh, exorcisms are practiced across cultures, so there, there seems to be a, it seems to be universal to believe in demonic possession and exorcism and to practice that. Uh, and so it's practiced within uh, Islam and uh, various Orthodox churches uh, and obviously uh, the Catholic Church. But primarily in this country, I think deliverance ministers and deliverance ministries practice that. Uh, and also New Age exorcism. That's a really strange one that is gaining popularity where uh, instead of seeing an exorcist, you'll see a, a demonologist or a psychic medium. Uh, or a shaman or any number of these other new age types that uh, will exercise the demons out of you. Uh, so yeah, that's what I was talking about yesterday. <laughs> so doing research for the book, did you go to churches where, did you witness any Absolutely. Quote, quote I didn't want it to be an armchair right. thing. I wanted it to be a hands-on thing mm -hmm. uh, because people will often think, well, you don't know what my beliefs are. You haven't experienced this. You don't know what it's like. Mm -hmm. So it was important for me to have the personal experiences. And some of them were harder than others. It was very easy to find a charismatic church and to attend a healing session. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very easy for me to, to even get into an Amish Mennonite church. Uh, or to go to a, a New Age church. Mm -hmm. But things like the fundamentalist Mormons, they're closed societies. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, a bit of a different case. And I actually went to uh, a, a fundamentalist compound, or it was a former compound, and uh, I went through with a real estate agent. And there was still a lot of information there that I could put into the book, more than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. uh, for me to just turn up on the, the steps of a compound and say, let me in, that's right. not going to happen. Right. But with these people gone, there was still a lot of fragments of them left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was able to just find out a lot of information. It was actually linked to, uh, have you heard of Warren Jeffs? He mm -hmm. was the president of the Fundamentalist yeah, Mormons. Sure. Uh, and so this was a, a sort of a safe house for his wives, some, some of his wives, oh, okay. and they were moving them from house to house. And so in doing some background research and just seeing the premises too, for example, uh, I'm told, I was told by the, the realtor, oh, there's a swimming pool you know, under one of the rooms here. I mean, why would there be a, an underground swimming pool? It must have been a baptismal pool or right. something. Uh, but they, they lied to me as well and they said, oh, this place was a, a hunting retreat and then another realtor said it was a, a bed and breakfast. I mean, how do you explain all of those rooms? This uh -huh. place had uh, maybe about 30 bedrooms. And uh, at one point they had about 100 people living there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't zoned for that sort of thing. Uh, and then with something like Satanism, uh, it's, there are a lot of similarities between Satanists and, and skeptics, mm -hmm. and most of them are atheist or, or humanists anyway. Very few of them actually believe in Satan. Uh, and so the rituals that they perform are more for psychodrama. They're not doing it because they actually believe in anything. Right. It's, it's more for sort of getting your frustrations out. Uh, and so they're private things that might be husband and wife who were Satanists mm -hmm. uh, identify that way and then perform rituals together. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no Church of Satan as such anymore. I mean, there is uh, in Hell's Kitchen in, in New York. It used to be in San Francisco. Uh, but it's not like you can, again, just go to a church and, and say, hey, I just want to watch. You yeah. guys let me watch. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, I had to do my research. And, uh, and so I reconstructed a satanic ritual, how it would be with the female, naked female as the altar yeah. and... Uh, drinking blood, uh, you know, wine as blood and, and all of that sort of thing and all of the, the mockery that they do of uh -huh. Catholicism. That's, <laughs> that's really interesting. It is, it is. But yeah, some things were easier to get into than, than others, that's for sure. Sure. With book. So with things like uh, like uh, obsession, uh, speaking in tongues and things like that, is it, I mean, is it power of suggestion? Is it taking um, 
it's a, a whole bunch of things. As I was saying earlier, part of it's socialization. So if you're raised to believe in this, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a positive thing. You want to experience it. Uh, there's that. And it's also, I think, uh, just the communal environment, uh, communal reinforcement, mm -hmm. that if everyone around you is doing it, then you're going to do it too. Yeah. Otherwise, it means that you're not as holy as the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, lots of factors mm -hmm. are, are at play. But I think it's kind of, I always call it a pious peer pressure. <laughs> yeah. So after observing these, you know, going mm -hmm. to different churches, did you come away thinking, wow, these people are bananas crazy? Or did you kind of Ooh. feel more empathetic towards it? Uh, I went through both. I think that in reading the book, you will, a lot of these beliefs and practices will resonate with you. Uh, particularly the, the Quakers. I really felt a strong resonance with them. I went to a, a Quaker meeting mm -hmm. uh, and they're very different. I think in many ways, well, there are two branches. There are conservative Quakers and in many ways they're just like Protestants. Uh, but with the, the more liberal Quakers, a lot of them are atheist. It sounds really strange, but you can ha you can be an atheist Quaker. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not diametrically opposed. Uh, so you can be, a lot of them call themselves non-theist Quakers. Uh, and so in going to their meeting, it was, I don't know if you know much about them at all, but they have these, they call them silent, uh, unprogrammed meetings. And you basically meet there, it's kind of a social gathering at first, people drink tea and coffee, they don't eat Quaker's oats, even though I, people keep <laughs> asking me that. Um, and then they, they kind of, someone signals and everyone just sits down, they've got pews um, and they're silent for a period of maybe up to an hour and they use this time for reflection. And so you had a mixed bag of people there. I mean, clearly uh, there were people who were religious mm -hmm. uh, and then there were people who weren't. There were clearly atheist people there. And for them, it was a kind of meditation. They don't like to say that though. Mm -hmm. um, for others, it was their way of communicating with God. So if you look at uh, the early Quakers, they thought that uh, instead of having clergy uh, as an intercessory, intercessory uh, thing, you can have a direct, direct communication with God. Sure. So you don't need these people in the middle uh, to get to God. So today uh, they have these silent meetings and they'll reflect on things. But the, the kind of weird woo aspect of it is that occasionally someone will stand up and they will have, uh, they call it giving vocal ministry. Uh, and they, they will receive a revelation from God or from spirit or from, I think there are shades of new age to it as well, but from whatever they believe in, they may have a, a revelation. So it could, uh, it could be something maybe they read in the newspaper the day before, even though they call that, I think, daffodil ministry or something, that you're just commenting on nature around you. Oh. But other people might come up with a Bible verse, uh, but something, they have some kind of revelation that comes to them. And uh, I think if you look at the history of the term Quaker too, uh, one of the beliefs is that uh, these people would stand up and they would quake. They, they would have something that they had to say. They had to get off their chest from God. Uh, and so that's where that practice comes in today. They'll just stand up out of their seat. And I saw that just once. It was a woman who stood up and uh, started talking about some religious song and quoted some lines from that uh -huh. and then sat down. Uh, and so it was incredibly interesting. But the, how they resonated with me is uh, they have these things called the Quaker Testimonies. Um, and they, they believe in peace and they believe in stewardship and they're, they're very good people. I think they're, they're practicing what they preach. Mm -hmm. I, it would just be nice if they would do it uh, for humanistic reasons right. rather than spiritual mm -hmm. reasons or uh, religious reasons because they're, they're really very close to, to atheists. Yeah. Uh, you said they shied away from the word meditation? Is yeah. there a specific reason? Um, I think that, that maybe they see that as being new age or something, or uh, they, they still the older crowd in particular, they really view it as a spiritual experience. Uh, and so for them, if you look at it as meditation, then that's somehow reducing it. It's not of God. Oh, okay. So again, mixed bag of people, lots of different beliefs. So you, uh, every single Quaker is different, They're very individual. Um, so what is your, do you have a distinction between a religion and a cult? Oh, oh, I mean, there are people who've written tracts on that. Yeah. And it's a really hard thing. Uh, I think a lot of these belief systems that I looked at, because they're minority, very quirky mm -hmm. religious beliefs and practices, uh, some people might look at some of these that will denigrate them as being cults. Mm -hmm. And some of them are. Fundamentalist Mormons, it's a cult. Yeah. Are the Amish not necessarily? In many ways, it's a way of life. Mm -hmm. It does involve religion, but um, I, I don't know if you could see that as a cult. Maybe it's in the eye of the beholder, really. 
Um, Satanism, not so much. These people are a lot like skeptics and mm -hmm. have their own beliefs. Uh, so uh, with the fundamentalist Mormons, for sure, it's definitely a cult and uh, perhaps aspects of the charismatics and then uh, Scientology, that was one chapter, yeah. and absolutely a cult. And to you, what distinguishes a cult from a religion? Oh, that, that's such a tough question. And maybe it's the element of, of brainwashing, maybe it's the element of removing sure. people uh, from the rest of society. So mm -hmm. with the fundamentalist Mormons, I mean, the Amish, they do that too. They, yeah. they segregate themselves and it's for uh, reasons that, that don't involve abuse or manipulation, even though there are aspects to that. I mean, the, the Amish, we, we tend to think of them as, as being uh, very good moral people, but sure. <clears throat> excuse me, there's certainly a lot of uh, negativity and, and uh, I, I just came across so many cases of rape and, and abuse uh, within their society and even things like um, uh, puppy mills where they're, they're raising animals on the cheap and they're abusing them, mistreating them. Mm -hmm. uh, even things like them selling raw milk, which you can catch tuberculosis from right. and other illnesses. So they have their underbelly, strangely. Uh -huh. uh, but with the fundamentalist Mormons, uh, they they segregate themselves, remove themselves from society so they can abuse. Uh, and the same thing with Scientologists, with suppressive persons mm -hmm. and, and all of that. They uh, want to get you away from your family yeah. uh, and, and just be able to manipulate you. How is it trying to get into Scientology? I understand that they're really hard to kind of access. Well, yes and no. Uh, I live in Denver at the moment mm -hmm. uh, and I went to the, the local uh, downtown Denver uh, Scientology church mm -hmm. and uh, they were kind of surprised when I walked in because usually they're having to drag you in yeah, yeah. And, and here I am just let me in I want to <laughs> come and attend the Sunday service. Yeah. They have services. I didn't and know that. I know I, I didn't know that initially either. Uh, so they, they are a church and basically uh, over the years, they've had their church status taken away from them a number of times. So in trying to be perceived as a church, they've adopted all of these really weird um. little things. Uh, and I'll get into that in a second, but uh, they've got the cross, which is I think the eight point cross. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have symbols, some which look very Freemason like, um, but they've interwoven these aspects, this kind of semblance of mm -hmm. religion so that they can keep their tax free status. Sure. So I turned up. Uh, and they were very welcoming, but just surprised that I'd walked in off the street. You know, What's wrong with you, sort of thing? <laughs> and uh, I said I'd like to attend the Sunday service, and they were surprised by that too. So again, I think it's a kind of facade. Uh -huh. uh, and so they I had to throw together a service really quick because you're going to be there. It was like that, and <laughs> so I walked in and uh, was introduced to this fellow, and he he took me around first and introduced me to uh, just all of their, they, I mean, walking in there, it's like going into Barnes and Noble or something, which only has L. Ron Hubbard stuff. Uh, the, the place is just full of his books and videos of him. It's just very expensive and upmarket. Uh, I would think it was a design studio or um, marketing firm or something, just, yeah. just by the looks of it, really flashy. Uh, and so anyway, this guy showed me around and tried to, uh, oh, he gave me a, you put me onto one of the e-meters and we did a little test with that. And did you? I used a little trick so that it wouldn't move and, and he's, oh, there's something wrong with it and grabs out another one and let's try this one instead and that one wouldn't work either. Oh, it's broken, you know, we'll, we'll find another one later on. Strangely enough, they didn't do the Oxford analysis test, which is what they normally right. do, the, the stress test mm -hmm. thing. Well, actually the stress test is the, the e-meter, uh, but they normally have this 200 uh, question questionnaire where they try to sell you all of their classes and stuff, but they didn't do that. so. Uh, I guess they were just thrown by me mm. being there for the service. Uh, and so anyway, the, the fellow who showed me around, uh, he came back after about half an hour and suddenly he's wearing a little cross and he's the minister. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, so will there be much of a congregation here today? And he said, oh, there's usually a family who joins us, uh, but they're not here today. And yet there were people running around everywhere. So all of their acolytes and, and people they have working there didn't attend. It was a, a church service with just me really creepy, one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. So I sat there in the audience, a beautiful church, it was so opulent, uh -huh. so decorated in marble and mosaics and uh, it was really beautiful, but they had this bust of uh, L. Ron Hubbard there. So they're really, now that he's dead, they're really turning him into a god. Yeah. And uh, so I sat there by myself and this guy's doing this service. <sighs> it was incredible. Instead of uh, the sermons were basically L. Ron Hubbard stories, and he's reading science fiction stories, and, and that's... Like reading his books or telling about L. Ron Hubbard? Uh, reading from his books. Okay. And 
they had uh, <clears throat> excuse me a number of prayers and things, but really it was just his various sayings from his sci-fi books reinterpreted as being religious somehow. And then it, we got to an audit. I couldn't believe it. Uh, part of the service was, and I can't remember what they called it, it was a community something, uh, but it was an audit. And okay. what he was trying to do was to put me into this hypnotic state, essentially. And he's saying, I want you to, to measure your ear, take your, your fingers and measure your ear and then measure your foot. And, uh, so he's giving me all of these directions and they were really monotonous. Uh -huh. And he'd get me to do them again and again. I want you to visualize this. I want you to think about this. Uh, and just posing all of these things to me, these statements. Uh, I want you to think about uh, who owns you and uh, are you owned by your mother? Are you owned by your father? Are you owned by Tiffany's? And it's just this monotony of these constant instructions. And I was really getting the shits or getting pissed off after a while because it just it just went on and on and on. And that part went for about 45 minutes. Oh, so yeah. they're trying to put you into this state as they do during the, uh, the audits uh -huh. uh, where you're in this state of suggestibility and then they can sell you more courses and, and abuse you. Uh, so it was really the strangest ceremony, religious ceremony I've ever been to. Afterwards, he gave me the, the royal tour of the building uh -huh. and the last room that he showed me was this uh, beautiful office and it was dedicated to L. Ron Hubbard and he said, we have an office in every church and it's set up as though L. Ron could just come back in and, and take, take up where he left off and he said it as though he almost believes that L. Ron would someday. Yeah. So there's definitely something going on within the movement where they're, I think, trying to martyr, well, not martyrize him, but present him as being a god of sorts. And uh, it's really creepy. But this was a beautiful, again, opulent office, and you'd think it was something out of a pharaoh's tomb if mm -hmm. you didn't, if it didn't have the e meter. <laughs> and was this building like is was this building constructed by the Church of Scientology, or or is it like? Church of Scientology, Rush yes, okay. it's theirs, and uh, I, they have so many churches in Denver, um, a number of them, and I hear they're opening another one too. Really? So they're doing very well financially. Well, big business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so when you would go in, would you say like, hi, I'm writing a book about how crazy you are, <sighs> or would you kind of uh, oh, For everything, low? or for the Scientologists? I just, well. Uh, well, I think I took a different tactic with, with everything okay. uh, that I did. When I went to uh, the Amish uh, Mennonite church, uh, I went with my husband because I had a contact. Basically, his father was a um, was the, the sheriff, I think, for, for the area that they lived in. Uh -huh. And he was very well respected. So I had an in okay. that way. Uh, with the Scientologists, I just turned up and said I was interested and had a lot of respect for them and, and wanted to learn more. Um, let me think, with the charismatic church, um, my husband and I are trying to have a baby at the moment. So we said we're, we're infertile and we, we need some healing. Uh, so that a lot of these places are very accepting they want you to be there and want you to be a part of things mm -hmm. uh, with the demonic possession and uh, exorcism chapter uh, we went to see Bob Larson the deliverance minister or the, the real exorcist he, mm -hmm. he calls himself and so that was open to the public anyone could turn up okay. uh, and witness that so there was a real mix of, of various welcomings or, or not being welcomed did you ever feel like they were sort of putting on a show for you or did you feel like you got an honest representation of what it would be like. Obviously, there's oh, another a good question, people. and I think it uh, depends. Uh, I mean, with Bob Larson, it's really just such a cultural thing. Everyone's there, and uh, he's pushing his books and pushing seminars and, and trying to get donations and things. Uh, and then, as soon as he goes into exorcism mode, everyone starts acting. Everyone's role playing. People start growling. There's a woman in front of me, and and she's groaning and growling. And I thought she's possessed possessed by the demon of overacting. <laughs> And uh, people knew what they were doing. They knew okay. what their roles were. But he also primed us to, to, to begin with. He uh, was showing us videos so people know how they're supposed to act. Oh. And then when he has someone up there and he chooses his victims very well, this guy is seasoned. He claims he's done over 20,000 exorcisms. Uh, and so he knows what he's doing. And he would pick people and bring them up. And it was really just a show for everyone. Uh -huh. And uh, he would know who to choose who would be uh, performing most crazily for the audience um, so yeah it, it really depended with the charismatic church again uh, it was part ceremony or part religious ceremony and part healing as mm -hmm. well so what would happen is you turn up and there'd be a service uh, I call the charismatic karaoke because 
they just hand or they had someone had a microphone and people would just come up and grab it and and just go into this weird soliloquy. Uh, I mean, there were so many crazy things happening there. There was a guy with flags just walking around. People started behaving like children. It was like they were in a play pit or something. A woman just collapsed on the floor and just lay there. So they call it being slain in the Holy Spirit. Uh, another guy in front of me started sobbing openly. Um, other people were speaking in tongues, and so people were just there to let their hair down, really, and, and, and just doing their own thing. Watching these people go bananas. And that's the thing. Again, my husband's there with me, oh. and we just felt like two people sitting in a church, while everyone else oh. around us is is acting very differently. And uh, so the the pastor of the church, she. Uh, saw us and and I think she kind of singled us out because we're new mm -hmm. and we look so normal we're just sitting there <laughs> uh, and so she came over to us and she said I've got a, a song in my heart for you from from God and so she started reciting it was um, bibliomancy just like plucking uh, a biblical text out of nowhere and saying it's for you uh, and as though it's from God inspired by the Holy Spirit and she read something out of like Isaiah 54 it was totally irrelevant it didn't mean anything to who we were or what our situation was and then she started singing to us so it was like she was this frustrated uh, music teacher or something and uh, it was just a really crazy event and so I felt like they were putting on a show but maybe not necessarily for us it was just they, them doing their thing uh, and again Maybe with the, the uh, Amish Mennonites, they, they just did their own thing. They looked very disapprovingly at me because I was wearing jeans and a hoodie and they're in their sort of prairie dresses yeah. and everything, uh, the men in their suits. Uh -huh. uh, and so all the young girls were staring at me so longingly to, to wear <laughs> English clothes. And uh, so that, that was, again, they were just doing their own thing and, and we, I was lucky to be there. Yeah. Um, so really dependent on the nature of the, oh. the group. So with the... With the um, the last one you were talking about with the singing and the yelling. Do they, so I'm trying to imagine they walk in like just off the street, mm -hmm. the and the show just, starts. They go nuts. Yes, and then does For it just two turn hours. off? And then and they go to brunch. Like is well, it was actually an evening ceremony, but that's what it was like. They they turn up and for all intents and purposes, normal people uh -huh. uh, dressed like me. Uh, you wouldn't pick them uh -huh. in a, a safe way uh, as being charismatics. Uh, it might be different in other parts of the country, maybe in the south, but they just turned up and they uh, fell into their roles and performed them and then left. So it's like a cathartic thing, I think. They get there and they get everything out of their system uh, and then they leave and just return to the, the rest of the world. <laughs> and was that, of all the things you saw, was that the most, like, jarring? Besides the Scientology one was weird. I think it was all jarring. I think just even turning up to the Amish Mennonite church, uh -huh. uh, I... Uh, stepped out of my car and was just in a little white SUV and funny enough you think oh the Amish they don't drive cars well uh -huh. the Mennonites this particular branch they're on this continuum mm -hmm. of uh, just how conservative they are and this group is less conservative more liberal mm -hmm. and they had uh, far better cars than than I had <laughs> uh, but anyway it was just the weird thing when I stepped out of the car and I just turned around and I felt like I was in a BBC period drama and uh, here I am again, my hoodie and jeans, uh -huh. and they were dressed beautifully with capes and these long dresses, uh, and the guys in their suits with their hats, and it really felt like I'd stepped into, and in the middle of nowhere too, the church was just really hard to find, uh -huh. uh, and I just felt like I was in another world, did and that, that was jarring. Hair? Or did the women cover their hair? Um, the young girls don't, they just have it back in it, they grow it long, because uh -huh. for biblical reasons they keep it, they don't cut it. Right. Uh, in fact, there was a a guy a couple of years ago, I can't remember his name, um, but he went about cutting off the beards of Amish men. I don't know if you heard of oh, him. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ooh, I can't remember his name, Papa something, but he, he was a bishop, Amish bishop. Mm -hmm. And so doing that is uh, just one of the worst things that you can do. It's like Samson, Delilah, yeah, yeah. cutting Samson's hair. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the women would have their hair covered by their prayer caps. And basically, again, it depends what how conservative you are, but often... Uh, they believe that they need to wear their prayer caps at all times, mm -hmm. even when they're having a bath, uh, even when they're sleeping, that they need to wear that. It's a, I think Corinthians 1, um, some passage about having to cover the head for women. And so it's really sad to yeah. think that some of them are scared to take their, their caps off. Uh, so they were wearing, a number of were wearing caps, and they were wearing them with pins too. So not with bobby pins or anything, it was just with pins that looked like, okay. ouch. Yeah. Uh, and the young girls, I think up to a certain age, maybe marriage age, they, they just grow their hair long and just wear it back in a plait. Mm -hmm. 
did you, uh, you know, when you would go to various places, did you feel like you had to dress a certain way or like cover your own hair? Or did <laughs> to be you ever honest, it's probably one of my regrets. I think I could have dressed a bit more appropriately. I think uh -huh. I could have worn uh, something that would have fit in a bit more and made them feel comfortable because mm -hmm. uh, I felt like, uh, in particular, I think the the adults were uh, very welcoming. Had this kind of air of superiority as well that, that I don't know if they knew or could sense or smell that I was an atheist but they did talk about isn't it sad that atheists can't appreciate a sunset the way that we do and uh, had some sermons sad. on how terrible it is to drink and how terrible it is to be lustful and, uh -huh. and all these things but um, yeah I think I could have dressed to fit in with them a bit more because I, I think I put off the young girls and, and the young uh -huh. boys by just staring at me they were very unfamiliar sure. uh, with my dress sense <laughs> Which just seems so everyday and common mm -hmm. to, to us. Uh, God bless America. God bless America. And it should be, it's available for pre order now on Amazon and through the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will be coming out, so I think, mid September mm -hmm. if you pre order it and available uh, to the general public in October. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was thank you. fascinating. Oh, it was good fun to rehash everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much. And thank you.